You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, everyone, very excited. Title of the episode, Raising Your Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence. We have Carol Pittner and Doug Nordman joining us on the show today. And they are launching or releasing their book with the Choose If I Family of Publishing in July of this year. It's now available for pre-order as you're hearing this. And I just could not be more excited. This is the book that I wanted to do the research on so I could eventually write because we need it. I mean, everyone listening to this at some point you, you get a plan for yourself and you're like, all right, I understand. You don't need to convince me I'm pursuing financial independence, but how do I get my kids to get started sooner? Do I force this on them? Do I compel them? They have to do this. How do I create a scenario where they opt into this of their own volition, of their own choice? How do I give them the chance to make these decisions that can reclaim decades of their life? Because they see that on their own. This book covers that and more, and it does it through the lens of, Doug's experiences raising his daughter, Carol, and just incorporating these lessons naturally into her life. It has two perspectives. It has the parent flailing around trying to make something land and the daughter looking at it through the lens of post saying, eh, that worked. This worked. That was okay. Here's how I would have pivoted it. This episode is going to contain incredible value for you. And this book is going to be even better. So with that, to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. First, it's long overdue that we had Nords on the podcast generally. He is the author of The Military Guide and is just a long standing icon, really, <laughs> in the financial independence community. So uh, that is long overdue. But certainly, as the father of two daughters, I find this entire concept of teaching your children next generation phi just utterly fascinating. And it's really, really important to me. So I, the book is fantastic. It's so cool how every single chapter, they talk through each of their own perspectives. And it was just, it was just a really neat and interesting format. And most importantly for the audience, it's about how do you progressively expose your children to new experiences with money? That was my big takeaway is this is a journey. This is a journey from zero to 18, 22 and beyond. And it's just really cool how they went about it. So with that, Doug and Carol, welcome to Choose a Vi. Thanks, guys. I'm glad to be here. And I've really enjoyed all the Facebook lives you've been doing during our last month of uh, social isolation. And it's great to be here. I have to admit, in general, I'm really happy with Choose Vi's Facebook presence. That's something that I find a connection yeah. to the community through. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and Doug, thank you so much for all the work that you've done in the, in the Choose the military group as well. I know that's become a real resource for people that are looking for dynamic answers to their questions quick. I mean, you, you've been an incredible mentor for that group. So thank you for all of your help with that. As you were talking about, Carol, there's a Choose the family and kids group. I mean, in the financial independence community, it would be a stereotype to, to say that this is for single males on the path, just trying to do this for himself. And that, that's ridiculous. <laughs> People from all walks of life are trying to do this. And what's crazy is we could talk about a niche like, you know, the military, or we could talk about a separate niche of software engineers, yep. whatever that niche looks like. The common ground there is that the vast majority of these individuals are thinking about this for themselves. And at some point thinking about this for the next generation, for their kids. So, uh, Doug, this is your and Carol's story. Like what was the inspiration to write a book about this? Well, we kept getting that question about how are you raising your kids for your financial independence? And uh, the first time I had the question, I just babbled an answer. I really hadn't even thought about it. In fact, it happened at a camp FI and I had just finished giving a talk about investing and uh, the audience, you know, they either heard the story before or didn't care. I'm not really sure, but they asked the very first question was, well, okay, we get it. Uh, how are you raising your kid? What do I do about my family? Now, this happened over a two-year period, and by the second or third time that we got the question, either at a, a camp 
presentation or online. I remember coming home uh, one night and telling my wife, I said, you know, I got that question again about how do you raise that money savvy family? And she said, well, you got to write that book. And uh, then we went back. We were on travel at the time and we sat down with uh, Carol and KJ. We were visiting them at, at their apartment and we asked the question, you know, hey, we keep getting this question at uh, Camp FI and, and seminars uh, about raising your kids for financial independence. How did we do that? Do you remember? Tell us what you remember about being exposed to money and managing your money and, and learning about financial independence. And suddenly Carol lit up. And that was the thing is at the time I was going through, there's a transition program that you have to go through in the military before you switch from active duty to any other status. And to say I was bored out of my mind in that class is an <laughs> understatement. There are a lot of things they were covering that I had luckily already seen in high school. And at that point, I already had a plan that I was going to transition to the reserves and so on and so forth. And so when mom and dad said, hey, we've been thinking about writing this book, I actually spent most of that that week-long program writing start of the chapters and the outline and coming up with cool quotes and just the, the skeleton of the book, really. Wow. So that was something you dove into right away. You were like totally on board. Completely. She had about three of her chapters written before I'd finished the outline and, and, and caught up with, you know, my side of the story. We would do it as a back and forth narrative. And so we talk about what we came up with as a parenting tactic or an overall strategy. And then we talk about what we did. And then Carol tells you how it really worked out. <laughs> you know, I'm fascinated by Carol's perspective. So for context, for our audience, Doug, you reached financial independence. So you were active duty. Your career was active duty in submarines for the uh -huh. Navy. And that was your vehicle and your path to financial independence. Carol, what was your perspective? Did you have the terminology as a kid or as a tween, as a teen, that your parents had reached financial independence? Did you know that was a goal for them? Yes and no. The term financial independence was still coming up in the ranks, but early retirement was what I was more aware of. And in the military in particular, when you've done 20 years of service, you are eligible to retire and your pension kicks in. And so at first I was completely on the side of, oh, dad is just living off the pension. You know, he's done his 20 years of naval service and this is how the family is living. And it wasn't until a little bit later in life that I realized, no, that's not what mom and dad are living off of. They're not living off the pension at all. They're living off the portfolio that they had been concurrently growing while mom and dad were in the Navy. And so it, it was something where I knew what the early retirement lifestyle could look like, but I didn't quite have the terms figured out until I was into my mid-teen years. Yeah. And Carol, I love the little anecdote in the book about how you saw your dad driving the family tourists <laughs> with surfboards strapped to the roof. And that was a big motivator for your own Feigl's. Like, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. Like, what did, what did your friends think when dad's tooling by with the, uh, the surfboards? Well, I should point out that for most of my friends and a lot of my classmates thought that I was weird growing up. I mean, I already established that Nordman baseline of weird. So to, to see my dad, you know, coming up to the bus stop and stopping at that stop sign and waving with the surfboards, it's like, yeah, that's the Nordmans. Of course he would do that. <laughs> So, Doug, Carol actually mentioned something pretty important, and she said most people, when you see Navy families or you see individuals in the military that have done their, their service, you know, they've, they've put in 20 years, you have some incredible advantages. You have TRICARE basically taken care of. You have an inflation-adjusted pension taken care of. I mean, you have a lot of tools here when you do a full 20 years that make financial independence almost, as long as you take care of your baselines and you understand the math, almost inevitability. But she had kind of added this asterisk. Oh, but wait, that's not actually what he did. That wasn't what he relied on to get to this point. So add some flavor to that. What did your path to financial independence look like? Well, for, for my wife and I, it was a high savings rate. That's how we really achieved financial independence. We didn't realize this at the time. We reached financial independence in late 1999. And a couple of years later, after finding the 4% safe withdrawal rate and all the studies on that, we went back through our records and said, wow. We reached financial independence two years ago. We have enough money. The uh, pension is great. And as you mentioned, the health insurance is probably worth even more than the pension in terms of having that backstop and that comfort and sleeping at night. But the biggest benefit is having that pension, a steady inflation adjusted annuity. So, you know, no matter how badly you screw everything else up, you know that the following month you're going to have a pension check come in. We live off the, not just the pension, but also off of the 4% safe withdrawal rate from our investments. You know, the pension is the small annuity that gives us the reliability and the longevity insurance. And then everything else that we've saved over the years, our financial independence is based on that portfolio. And now our withdrawal rate has dropped considerably over the years. Right now we're down around 3.5%. So that's all the baseline for financial independence. And where you go from there is a high savings rate is, is what sets it all up and makes it all work. 
I retired from active duty in 2002 and Carol was nine and a half years old at that point. So nine and a half years learning that your parents have stopped working day to day gives you plenty of time. I, you, you were happy to have mom and dad home all the oh, time yes. to be around you, at least at least up until the teenage years started. She was happy to have mom and dad around. And, and that's a big benefit to raising a family is just having time. I mean, from the parenting perspective, you want to spend more time with your family. And I, I don't think military families are necessarily aware that a high savings rate during your military career will give you financial independence. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I write the blog posts is to educate more people about reaching financial independence while you're still in uniform. And one thing that I was very surprised by is both my parents retired from the Navy with more than 20 years of service. They both got their pensions. But one thing I was surprised to learn as I was coming up in the Navy is that only about 17% of people in the military actually retire at 20 years or more. So that means that at least one person, maybe two people out of 10 of everybody you see at your command is going to make it to 20 years or more. And I think that's a misconception. A lot of people believe that the military is easy to make it to 20 years. And the reality <laughs> is that it's a very, very minor part of the military that actually makes it all the way to the point of earning a pension. Mm. And that's a whole nother podcast episode. <laughs> we're going to do oh, it. Yes. Doug, I'm booking it right now. We're going to send you the calendar link. We're, we're going to set this up. But actually, you've teed us up for it perfectly because while we just identified this inflation-adjusted pension, we just identified TRICARE, I believe within the last two years, the military rolled out a blended retirement system, which uh, made this kind of transition to this choice even easier. And Carol, I know that your path is no longer 20 in active service. In fact, I believe already now you're in the reserves Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of sense of what enabled you to be comfortable with that choice, knowing you know the, the benefits of what you might be walking away from. As Dad mentioned, it was a high savings rate from the very beginning. You know, When I was an 01, as they call an ensign, I'd always been saving at least 40% of my paycheck. And at sometimes it was 50%. There was a few months in there where we spent so many uh, months at sea that I was actually at a 90% savings rate for a brief <laughs> amount of time. It was, it was a lot of sea time. And one of the things that mom and dad were always clear to me was don't make the Navy a family business, stay as long as you're having fun. And it got to the point where I realized that I wasn't having as much fun as I used to have. And oh, by the way, I've been married for a couple of years at this point. We were thinking about having kids ourselves. And being the daughter of two active duty military, I remember mom and dad tag teaming me. That's how busy it was trying to have two active working parents and then still trying to manage a child at home. And so I'm, I'm looking at the career that my husband and I both had set up and I realized that I didn't love the Navy enough to stay on active duty. I didn't want to sacrifice my family for the job. And so I did the exact opposite. I stepped back from the Navy. I went from full-time work to part-time work. That's what the reserves are, is effectively part-time work. And so that way, I'm at home with our daughter for most of the day. And right now, my husband's in a billet where he's actually working for his master's degree. So he spends most of his day in classes. But moving forward, if he was assigned to a ship or if he was assigned to an operational command where he's on deployments all the time, I'm able to be at home with our family. And I think this transitions us really well into talking about money lessons, right? Being money savvy and having the wherewithal to understand that you have options, uh, even as you know early on in your financial journey as, as you were, there's this saying, and I think every culture has a version of it, wealth does not pass three generations. In Scotland, the father buys, the son builds, the grandchild begs. Here in the United States, shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves in three generations. Yep. There's, there's multiple variations of this quote in every culture. And that seems to hold true. And what you have done already, you've already broken this to some varying degree. You've already broken this trend, this cycle, because of the lessons, like you've identified these lessons are in the book or what allowed you to make this statement not true and not applicable for your family. I think that's the setup for what we want to talk about today. How do we transmit or communicate these ideas? And Carol, at this point, these aren't your dad's ideas that he's forcing on you. This is your choice, your life, because it makes sense to you. Is that accurate? Exactly. Mom and dad, like all good parents, are trying to instill their family values in their child. And of course, most children are going to rebel at all costs just to be able to form their own identity and to find their own way. But the reality was that in the end, I figured out that this was something for me too. The freedom of choice was the biggest draw for financial independence, the ability to choose exactly the kind of life I wanted to have, the ability to, to weather any storm was a big draw to having financial independence. Yeah. And I love the quote early on in the book. You said, mom and dad started creating positive, understandable experiences with money so that I would have positive, understandable ideas about money. 
that just stuck out to me. And I'd love to hear, like, how did they initially go about this? And at what age, ultimately? You know, there are lots of parents in the audience who are <laughs> trying to figure out, like, do we do this with a two-year-old, a five-year-old, a ten? Like, when when does it start? It was a complete accident. Long story short, I started choking on a quarter. And dad had to rescue me. Yeah. She she was she was a toddler at the time. In my defense, oh my. she was a toddler at the time. <laughs> yeah. And so I'd they done what everything. all toddlers done. You know, I saw a shiny object on the floor and I picked it up and I popped it in my mouth. The next thing I know, I'm hanging by my ankles as dad tries to get the quarter out of my windpipe, you know. <laughs> oh wow. But um you know I that thought was, you said positive experiences. As when we say fun. twenty-five exactly. times your annual expenses, we're not actually talking about twenty-five uh, pennies. Like let's, let's, let's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And and so that's the thing, right? Is that that was a completely negative start to money, but I don't remember it at all. You know, that was one of those stories that came out while we were writing the book. And the reason why I don't remember that at all is because mom and dad learned from that lesson right off the bat. Okay, <laughs> let's not make this her only experience with money. Let's make sure she actually knows what is a quarter, how can you use a quarter, what makes it useful. And so the big thing was it's when it comes to kids, you have to start with playtime. You know, I first had to learn to stop eating money. You know, that that's going to be the first step is make sure that your kids are not eating coins when they see them on the floor. But the next thing they need to know is that it's it's safe to touch money. It's safe to play with money. It's safe to learn about money. And so one of the big toys I had as a kid was it was actually fake plastic coins in a little plastic cash register. And it was pure playtime. It was sorting the coins by size and making little piles and just counting money, making little games out of it. And as I started asking more and more questions and I became older and older, things were taught from there. So, you know, why is this quarter like this and why is this penny like this? Well, this means 25 cents and this means one cent. And that completely transformed into, well, if you have a dollar, you can buy this much. It got to a point where dad had a book that he found. It's called If You Made a Million. And it's a oh, picture yeah. book. And it's all about if you made a million, what could you spend your money on? And it'll say things like if you made a million, you could buy a plane ticket to the moon. If you made a million, you could buy, you know, a million pieces of candy. You know, it gave you a, a childlike concept of what your money can do for you. But it's it's very whimsical at first and just became more and more serious as you got older. So Doug Carroll said in there it being safe to talk about money. And I think that's so important because it, money yeah. for better or for worse, and usually for worse, is a taboo subject in a lot of families. And I think that's maybe carried down through generations and people just assume that's how it should be, right? And I know we've found that just kind of making money a normal part of our lives, not a focus, but just something that isn't taboo, something that we do talk about has helped our girls considerably. And I'd love to hear like the genesis of that for you and your family, if you remember. I'd like to pretend that we were brilliant parents and that we had crafted this plan carefully over many months of research and planning before we actually started. Yeah, Carol's already shaking her head. <laughs> and the answer is that you're exhausted. You're a new parent. You're trying to stay ahead of your kids. You're not getting enough sleep. You're getting woken up on the midwatch more often on shore duty parenting than you ever did when you were at sea. And when that happened, we just found ourselves talking with her. We knew that you should keep talking with your your baby, your toddler, as you're going about your day. And so we would go to the grocery store and she'd be riding in a grocery cart and we're talking about buying food and talking about money to buy food and talking about other things that money can buy. And it's just a stream of consciousness because you know, you're an exhausted parent, but also because you're talking about what's going on in your life and you want them to understand and focus on you and not get distracted by everything else going on around you in a grocery store. You just want to have their attention so that you can have some influence over their behavior. But that's how it starts is by having those conversations about going out and whatever you do. And gradually, as she got older, we realized that we could talk about these things. You know, she's mentioned the cash register and playing with the coins and learning how that works. But it was just one long series of conversations uh, every day when an opportunity would come up and we'd talk about these teachable moments and giving her more and more chances to learn about these things. And as they get older, you start giving them the tools they need. You start letting a kid manage a little bit of money. And the sooner they start, the better they get. And there's going to be plenty of mistakes. Kids learn about money. They learn to manage money by messing up. And the sooner that process starts with quarters as a four-year-old or a six-year-old or whatever age you decide to start, 
the better they get. And it's way better to do it at an early age with smaller amounts of money than it is to do it when they're in college with $20,000 or even worse at their first adult job with their company 401k or not using their 401k. And just by using the money that we are going to use to raise her anyway and letting her manage a little bit of it at a time and, and stepping up from there, we got to the point where as a young adult, she's perfectly comfortable with finances and managing her money and saving for financial independence. It's something she grew up with. Uh, it's something that you know you guys were aware of it and started a movement. And back in the last millennium when we were doing it, we were those wild-eyed hippie freaks who were trying to figure out how not to work anymore. <laughs> yeah, I love the concept of this progressive exposure. I think yeah. that that was really my big takeaway from the book. It's just this was a long, you know, 20 plus year journey of just progressively exposing Carol to more and more, even just something like that I thought was brilliant, but probably just a footnote is going to a monthly allowance as opposed to a weekly because, all right, she's ready now, you know, in her early teens to have a monthly allowance and, and realize, okay, now I have 30 full days to figure this out. And like you said, small lessons, right? Like she could have blown that all on the first or second of the month. And then <laughs> you got to learn, you know, you got 28 days left. Like I thought that was really cool. And like, did you and Marge have talks about this? Like how so many parents are, are like, you know, flailing in the darkness. I think that's, and, yes. and I'm sure you would, you know, self-deprecatingly yes. joke that, that you were doing the same and, and, and I get it. But like, did you guys talk about it? Like, how did you decide how to expose Carol to more things? You're always talking about what's worked and what hasn't during your day with your kid. And you're always doing the turnover and talking about things that have to get done next week. And with my spouse and I, we would start talking about what the next event is. You know, our daughter's coming up on her eighth birthday. Uh, what are we going to do for the eighth birthday? I mean, yeah, there's going to be a party and yeah, everybody's going to give her presents. That, that part's fairly straightforward planning. But how are we going to make this a memorable financial event? What's the big deal? When are we going to raise her allowance? And those types of debates, discussions, and you're just trying to stay out in front of the things your kid is showing that they're ready to do. You know, maybe they're really precocious and they're ready for that next step. Or maybe you tried something six months ago and it was a miserable failure and they're six months older and now you're ready to go back and start that all over again and try that technique for a second time now that they're you know older and wiser. And, and at least, you know, you the parent, you're older, but you're hopefully getting wiser too. And so we would sit down and have these discussions. And frankly, some of them are just desperation and that some of them come up at the moment. I think that at the time that we came up with the idea of Carol's kid 401k, part of that was born out of the fact that the Navy and the military was bringing in the thrift savings plan. And we had read books and we'd picked up information about how kids view money and kids aren't on board with the idea of saving for college, for example. When you're raising a kid, they need to learn to manage money. They need to handle the finances, handle the cash, make decisions. They're not on board with building wealth. Kids are not going to try to build wealth until they're much older. And so if you try to take a six-year-old and say, we're going to save money for your college fund, well, that's two more lifetimes away for a six-year-old, and there's just no way they can conceive that. So we were watching the military bring in the 401k, the thrift savings plan, and all the discussions around that. We had read about kids not having long-term goals for building wealth. And so on our eighth birthday, that's when we came up with the idea of the kid 401k. All these discussions, I mean, I, it's, it was a flash of inspiration. There were many discussions and there was some, some fumbling around, some trial and error. We joke about more error than trial. And then when that came out, then we knew what we needed to do. You know, I love this progression that we're describing here. And, and you know, I think part of something you said there is feels so painful is you have to let your kid make mistakes. And, and when your kid makes a mistake, oh, yeah. you feel like you've made a mistake. Oh, no, I failed. To kind of balance that with this is a long game. And if you want them to do well with money, you have to watch them do badly with money. You have to be able to let them make those mistakes, realize the consequences, and then iterate. My son is three years old. And I kind of view this like right <laughs> now, luck. 
Thank yes. you. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> uh, my daughter's uh, still working on that first year. So we're, 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 we're in the, we're in this phase right now where I'm trying to keep my daughter from swallowing quarters and my son's got that. And I realized that right now we're about to go into this like next phase. I love how the book kind of breaks it, the activities, the progression, it breaks it up into these different activities. We're moving into this, this really this first phase. All right. He's not swallowing quarters. Now at some point we're going to be rolling out the allowances, the chores, the implementation of jobs, you know, and then, and then from there past that point, you know, when you start talking about tweens, there's the kid 401k and others we will go there obviously, but Carol, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective, your perception on the allowance. We, we talked about this once a month allowance. And, and in the book, you talk about the allocation of jobs and chores. How did you view that as a kid and compare that to your experience now as a parent? So as a parent, I haven't really gotten started on personally giving my daughter an allowance. She's 14 and a half <laughs> weeks at this point. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're still pretty yeah. early in the game. Yeah. But as a kid, the first thing you look forward to is the weekend. You know, as a kid, you learn to look forward to the weekend because that's what your parents look forward to. And that's what your older siblings look <laughs> forward to when they're in school. And so that's how the allowance started was every Saturday I got three quarters and three quarters was 20, oh, 75 cents, three times of 25 cents. And it also meant that I could get three pencils from the pencil bending machine in the library at school because they had one of those little tabletop bending machines. It looks a lot like a straw dispenser, but it would spit out a random pencil every time you put in a quarter. And sometimes it would be, you know, a pencil that had parrots all over it, or it'd be a solid gold pencil, or it'd be some kind of sparkly thing. And it was, you never knew what kind of pencil was going to come out. And so as a, as a kindergartner, I was absolutely fascinated by that vending machine and to budget for three pencils a week was very easy to start with. <laughs> but then as you get older, as you get into first grade, as you get into second grade, you know, I'm not enamored by pencils anymore. Now I'm enamored by Pokemon cards and Pokemon cards at the time, I think was something like $5 a pack. And so now my allowance was a whole dollar a week. So I had to save up for five weeks to be able to get a pack of Pokemon cards. And so you, you start to learn how to budget, not necessarily by saying you have to learn how to budget. You start learning how to budget by setting some arbitrary cherry gold and a kid will figure out for you. For me, it was Pokemon cards. Well, you're going to have to save your money for several weeks if you're going to be able to afford a pack of Pokemon cards. And then you pay for the Pokemon cards and you have them in your hand and you realize you have no money. And so now you're realizing <laughs> I need to get more money. And so it's a natural progression. You start off with a desire that is very near and dear to the child's heart. And then from there, they naturally start to want to learn more about money just so that they can earn more and get more of what they love to have. Doug, in the book, you said, quote, our daughter's allowance did not depend on chores or behavior. And I think this is something that there are people on kind of both sides of this, right? Like some oh, yeah. people believe that very strongly that it should be essentially pay for service versus, you know, you're a member of the family and we're trying to teach you financial responsibility. So here is money to work with, essentially. And it sounds like you came down on the latter of the two, certainly. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that you know, kind of talk through how people should think about teaching their children about money generally through an allowance. We, we, we know there's a big debate on whether you should give your kid an allowance or whether they should grow up on commission. You know, some adults will still talk about having to earn every penny that they ever had in their lives when they were growing up. And, and we understand all aspects of that debate, but what worked for us and, and what might work for other families is to give out that allowance just so that they have an opportunity to get their hands on money. You want to give a young child enough of an allowance that they can imagine doing anything without buying everything. And there's got to be some limits. Every week they've got to get that allowance and have to make choices about what they're going to do with it. And there's got to be some limit there. They've got to have a finite amount. They've got to have a limited amount that they can work with. So that's all we did. Uh, and then the word was you got your allowance just for being a good member of the family. Uh, we knew that we needed to make sure there was a small trickle of money every week going into her to do things with. So we made it totally independent on behavior, of, of, of chores. You didn't have to do anything to get that allowance. All you had to do was be a, a good member of the family. And we never talked about it, exactly what that means or what you had to do. But we knew that she was going to have a reliable stream of income <clears throat> and she could make plans and decisions. And by reliable, I mean every Saturday morning her allowance would show up. Every Saturday morning I had a, a teachable moment. And we could talk about what her allowance was and how much she saved up or other things that she might want to do with her money. And that's when you have the discussions is when you're handing over the money and when you're talking about your choices, your options, and you're, you're dreaming uh, about what you could do with that. So that's the allowance part. 
And then later on in the book, we talk about if you really turn entrepreneurial and need more money, now you can talk about jobs and other ways to bring in more money for that really big prize that you're saving up for. I I mean, just for the sake of clarification for our audience who maybe is kind of in this phase right now, you have the steady stream of income. This is an allowance. It's not predicated Mm -hmm. on you doing your chores or not doing your chores. It's not predicated on your behavior, but you do delineate or distinguish that, Carol, you were given chores. And you also, there were chores, <laughs> but then there were also jobs that you could opt into to make additional income, like help our audience just understand that framework. And now they're saying, oh, well, how do we enforce chores? So with chores, there's other ways that you can punish a child for not doing their chores. For me, it was taking away electronic privileges. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't play with my Game Boy. I couldn't play with a PlayStation. I couldn't sneak off to a friend's house and go play with theirs. It was For me, it was electronics. That was a big loss of privileges. And every child is going to be different. You'll find for your children that there's some things that they value more, and that can be the form of punishment versus trying to take away their money. And when it came to chores and and jobs, you know, chores were something that I had to do. It was going to be a miserable existence because mom and dad were always going to be on me if I didn't do my chores. But when it came to jobs, it was a hybrid between me wanting to earn money and mom and dad wanting a little extra help around the house and then also me learning a new skill. One of the big things that mom and dad have always done when, when you're in the Navy, you learn some weird skills like how to paint a house and how to fix plumbing. And so mom and dad were frequently doing little handy chores around the house. They were always fixing toilets and painting walls and installing sprinklers and all these little random jobs around the house. And when you're five, six, seven years old, you can't do more than stand at the wall for 15 minutes, putting a paintbrush up and down. And the quality is a little questionable at first. But what would happen is for a 15 minute period, I would get maybe a dollar or two. And as I got older for an hour period, I would get 10 or $15 dollars. But as I was doing those chores and I was making money, I was also learning new skills. The best part about jobs was that if you wanted to earn more money from a job, you had to have all your chores done. And Mm -hmm. talk about aligning your financial incentives when your kid has suddenly realized that they need, you know, 10 more dollars for that next round of Pokemon cards and they're short on money and they want to earn money and they want to wash your car and mow your lawn and paint your house. All you have to do as a parent is say, well, are your chores done yet? and then stand back and let the magic happen. Doug, how heavy handed were you or not uh, in terms of getting Carol to save money? Like when, you know, I'm giving out (laughs) allowance to my daughters, I'm like, I'm saying, okay, if you can get in the habit of saving 50% of your income, like you're golden and then do what you want. Right. Like, but I don't want to, and how's that working for you? (laughs) Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. (laughs) And you know, it's it's a mixed bag. (laughs) Every kid is different, which is wild. It's, uh, you know, I see that with my daughters. They have very different personalities when it comes to money. And my older daughter, Anna, is just a natural saver, whereas my younger daughter, Molly, isn't. But she very happily saves 50 percent of her, quote unquote, income, right, her allowance, because that's been the habit. But, yeah, to your point, how's that working out for you? Right. Like, how did you guys conceptualize, like getting Carol to save money really on her own volition without it being heavy handed, just mom and dad forcing me? Well, I'll start out by saying that we uh, read a book It's uh, by the author, David Owen, and the name of the book is The First National Bank of Dad. And in there, he uses a metaphor of giving your kid a $20 bill, and your kid takes that $20 bill and lights it on fire, and then runs around the yard playing with it like a 4th of July sparkler. And that's the mental image you, the parent, have to have whenever you hand over money to your child, is they're going to waste it, they're going to blow it on something that has no value to you, the parent but is very entertaining and very valuable to the kid. They're going to have that experience over and over and over. You as the parent are helping them understand how they're feeling about this. You're saying, wow, look at what you did with that $20 bill. That made a lovely fire. Uh, what do you <laughs> want to do next? You want to light on a stack of hundred dollar bills or, or, but just discuss the emotions. The most important part is when they run out of money, you can start talking about those emotions. How do you feel? How was that toy? How long do you think it'll say, take you to save up and, and on and on and on. You recognize the emotions that they are feeling, but they don't have the vocabulary to articulate yet. And by having those conversations, they start to internalize it for themselves and figure out what they want to do differently. When you give them money for an allowance, again, it's all about learning to manage that money. It's not about building wealth. But David Owen came up with a brilliant tactic of giving his kids the certificates of deposit and letting them earn interest. 
kids don't do percentage math, so you have to make sure that you give them something they can understand. And frankly, you're bribing your kids to save money. So Carol would get her allowance and we would talk about all the wonderful things she could do with it and all the places she could spend it and say, but wait, there's more. If you put that money in the bank of Carol, then we will pay you a penny per dollar per month. And so you start out with a, a number that they can understand. They can understand one penny per dollar and per month. And then you build from there. And in our case, we would also write that down, right? You put it into a spreadsheet or you track it on some software like Quicken. And then every week when we give Carol her allowance, we'd talk about, here's your allowance. Do you want to keep that in cash? Do you want to deposit in the bank of Carol? Hey, your bank of Carol has $23 and it earned 23 cents in interest last month. Maybe you could put more money in there and earn more interest. You're not telling the child what to do. You're not making the rules or the laws too much. What you're trying to do is develop the financial incentive. So you've got some kid who's going to be a natural saver. They're all over that 12% interest rate. I'd like to invest at the Bank of Carroll. But you've also got the kid who's a spender, and they can start learning that deferred gratification. They can see the advantage of saving up the money. They're going to go through a lot of flat broke experiences before they get to becoming a a saver like the natural saver. But they're going to figure it out because they want to spend in bigger amounts and they know they have to save first. So just bribe your kids shamelessly with a high savings rate at the bank of your kid and let them figure out how to line up those internal financial motives so that you don't have to be that authority voice every day of their lives. You know, there's inflection points in any individual's financial journey, especially oh, yeah. as, a, as a young adult, as a, as a tween, nine through 12, as a teen. And there's a few things that you mentioned in the book that I, that I think are just so fascinating. They're so optimized when you look at them with the benefit of hindsight that you're like, oh man, <laughs> if I'd had this idea earlier, of course I would have done it. Well, here it is. We're trying to give it to you now. I want to talk about Carol, we'll get this from your perspective first, the approach for the first car and how profit Mm -hmm. sharing incentives and the kids 401k and you being selfishly motivated to capture some of these optimizations (laughs) that your dad was throwing at you played into your first car. One thing to mention is that I was born on Halloween. I'm born very late in the year. And so all of my friends were getting their driver's licenses before I was. They were all getting their learner's (laughs) permits before I was. So I had a really nice position as an armchair quarterback to watch all my friends go through the whole car endeavor. And it was very different with different friends. Some of them had the sweet 16 where their parents bought them a brand new car. And inevitably, a lot of the folks that had a brand new car at 16 would wind up totaling it sometime in the next two years before they went off to college or or their post-high school career. There were a lot of kids who heard their parents said outright, you can buy your own car, but we're not buying a car for you. You can share a car with your older sibling, or you can go and buy one on your own. And so I, I had plenty of time to to look at what other kids were doing and look at what other classmates were doing and see whether or not that worked for me as well. As dad mentioned, the 401k had started when the, the kid 401k had started when I was eight years old. And I knew that by the time I was 16, I was going to have $5,000. And you, you I have turned, to say that in a Dr. Evil voice, that's five thousand dollars. <laughs> and and that's the thing is that this is uh, this is 2008 when this was five thousand dollars. So this yeah. is just enough to buy that beat up Honda Civic that I'm probably going to be stuck on the side of the road with at least once, or, or. Mom and dad at the time, uh, they had the family Taurus that was the original surf mobile and that car was slowly dying. You know, it was almost as old as I was. It was starting to be on his last legs. There was more and more engine issues that were popping up. And so mom and dad were seriously considering buying a Toyota Prius, but Toyota Prius, you know, in 2008 had only been around for a few years. It was still pretty pricey car. It was new hybrid technology and mom and dad were sitting on the edge of that ledge thinking about taking the plunge, but they weren't quite ready yet. And randomly one day in the car, as we're all in the Taurus driving somewhere and we're talking about a new car, I say to mom and dad, hey, if I give you all my $5,000 for the family car, can I be the primary driver until I go to college and then I get my money back afterwards? And (laughs) (laughs) wait a minute. And and mom and dad said, that's a great idea. We're going to counter it with we are going to take any of the money that is required for damages. You know, if you get a fender bender in the parking lot, it'll come out of your money. If you total a car, you're not getting your money back. And so it's just like having a car lease. You know, any damage to the car that's not normal wear and tear was going to come out of my initial deposit. 
And so there, there was a minor fender bender in a Walmart parking lot that took $200 off my initial investment. But at the end of the one and a half years that I had between turning 16 and getting my driver's license and going to college a year and a half later, I got $4,800 back. And then I was able to take that $4,800 and put it into my next car in college. And then after being in the Navy for a few years, when I gained a little more wealth, I was able to sell that car and put that wealth into my next car. And it's the Kid 401k started off as one car and now it's turned into three cars. Wow, that is crazy. So, okay, where did this idea come from, first off? And I, I think a lot of, of having your kids grow up to be, I don't know, capable and responsible in the world and, and being able to deal with situations is being able to have them negotiate. Like there's a story in here about how you sold a graphing calculator, I think on Craigslist. And while your mom and dad could have done the transaction, like it was important that, that you actually took part in it, right? Like mm -hmm. you were there, you were the one handing it over, meeting the person. And, and, and I, I love that concept of like, you being part of, of the entire transaction, the negotiation. And in the case of this car, like where the heck did this come from? And like, what did you do to convince your parents? Like, Hey, I, I want a free lease for two years. Here's a security deposit, but essentially I want a free lease. Right. And, and part of it was just general creativity. It's not like kids are evilly sitting in the corner thinking, Oh, I have an idea for what to do next for mom and dad. It was sort of this idea of, I had $5,000 that was just enough money to buy a bad car and then here's mom and dad working together to buy one car. You know, here's two people in a family that are working together to buy a car, just as maybe two teenage siblings would work together to pull their money to buy a car. You know, it, it wasn't really a big leap to go from, hey, if I give mom and dad my money, I get a share of the car, just as two siblings are sharing a car. And so to, to put in $5,000, of course, I was the minority investor, you know, only $5,000 mom and dad are putting in the other, I think, $16,000 it was at the time. Yeah, and, we paid top dollar for that used Prius back in 2008. <laughs> exactly. But that concept of sharing, you know, even though it wasn't my car, it was just enough wheelage to get me through that last year and a half of high school because I knew that I was going to go elsewhere for college. And I knew that by the time I got to the college years, I might have a better job in which I was earning more money. And then I would have a better cash cushion to go forth and buy a better car. I wonder in hindsight, has your dad ever asked you like how much you were willing to negotiate? I, I imagine there was some more negotiation <laughs> there, right? Not, not, it wasn't like we sat down on opposite sides of the table in the Cosby show and we put that piece of paper back and forth. It was really a, it was like a family conversation. You know, one thing that dad mentioned, mom and dad in the background had been talking about when I'm eight years old and I have my eighth birthday, there's this new milestone. But what also happened was about my late tween, early teen years, I started joining the conversation as well. Hey, you're turning 14 this year. What kind of financial incentives are you looking forward to? Hey, you're turning 17 this year. You're going to be going off to college in a few months. What do you think we need to do with your allowance? Little questions that mom and dad would ask to hear my feedback. And kids are quite smart sometimes. They might surprise you with the answer. You know, Vicki Robin famously uses the term trading life energy for money in her book, Your Money or Your Life. And I saw that language uh, used several times throughout the book. And I'm, in particular, I'm curious, Carol, from your perspective, at what point was that verbiage yours? Like, were you thinking that way? Was there a particular point in time where you made that connection? Because I know that's a big inflection point for many of us where we make we start making that association even as adults. For me, it was a very different idea. It was the shiny toy on the shelf. And what I mean by that is you'll spend two or three months trying to do all these extra jobs. You know, you're saving up all your allowance. You want that shiny toy on the shelf. And so you finally get to that day where you go to the store and you pick off that toy off the shelf and you take it and you check it out and you get home with that shiny box and you open it and you take it out of the box and it's not so shiny anymore. And you start to realize that you've spent months and months waiting for this awesome thing and you get home and it's not as awesome as you thought it would be. And so I never really knew it as life energy. And, and I have to admit, I did not read your money or your life until about two months ago for the first time <laughs> in my life. But, but mom and dad had, you know, under the guise of teaching me how to take care of my money and take care of my allowance, they had also been teaching me about life energy. And so for me, it was much more physical. It wasn't this abstract concept of your time or your money. It wasn't a Ben Franklin, a penny saved is a penny earned. It was, it was all about that emotional response of when you took that toy home and now you had to change the batteries and you had to keep it clean and you had to make sure you didn't lose it with your friends. That was where I realized the concept of life energy. So I think one important aspect of letting your kids grow up is realizing that the world isn't perfect. 
right? That, that sometimes <laughs> yeah. you're going to fail and, and that's okay. You have to learn how to adapt and, and pick yourself back up or, or come up with a strategy, however it may be. And, and I'd love to hear about the great Carol Nordman bailout of 2009 with her, uh, her credit cards. It sounded like there was, there was quite a story there. And I, I'd be curious, Doug, I guess first to hear like when Carol came to you and said, I spent too much, like what, what went through your head? <laughs> I flash back to when I was 17 years old and had that same experience, right? And now, now what are we going to do? I'll be frank. I don't really remember this bailout. Uh, one of those stories that we had in the family was the thing going on in the background. I can remember getting Carol a card. And at that age, she was an authorized user and a credit card. My credit card just sat in my desk drawer and never got used. And so she came to us to talk about the problem. Uh, we didn't really have any awareness of it until she brought it up. And we were pretty matter of fact. I mean, everybody in the military goes through having more month than money and getting into debt like that and having to crawl back out. And I can't remember, Carol, that were, there weren't any lectures or finger pointing or admonishing or you know, where's more of an attitude of uh, how do you want to solve this problem, right? We had a discussion about a financial disaster and how you figure out fixing it. And I think we decided that there was going to be a lot of uh, labor for money, work for higher jobs to earn the extra income. And uh, I'm pretty sure mom and I had a big backlog of jobs at that point. Is that how we worked that out? <laughs> pretty much. And so at that point, I'd overspent about $250 on my credit card. Yeah. And at the age, let's see, 2009, so mm -hmm. I was just sort of 17 years old. And so the going rate for labor at that point, I was worth $15 an hour. And so we basically set up a zero interest loan, a 0% interest loan. And it was the expectation that over the next, I think it was two weeks or something like that, I would finish $250 worth of jobs to pay back the instant $250 loan that mom and dad gave me. Now, we never had to go further. I finished the jobs within the deadline. I never had to pay interest. Mom and dad never had to step up the next level of punishment. And the sad part is, <laughs> I don't remember what I spent that $250 on. That's that's oh, probably the worst part is. There's the lesson. I, yeah. Right. I, I remember the bailout more than I actually remember <laughs> the worth of whatever I spent that money on. And, and I think, you know, you talked about your money or your life. That was another good example of life energy was here I was slaving away at $15 an hour to earn back $250 in a very, very compressed time frame, which is not fun when you're a teen, let alone when you're an adult trying to work how many jobs to pay off your debt. And so that was that was very much a, a good life lesson there. And, and yeah. at this point, I should put, clarify that we parents have been having these discussions with our daughter for over 15 years. I mean, ever since she was old enough to talk in complete sentences, we'd been talking about money and feelings and having enough money for the things to make your choices. So by the time she's almost 17 years old and comes to us and says, I've spent more money than I have and I'm trying to figure out how to solve this problem, we've already got that trust. We've got the whole money relationship figured out and we could have that conversation without anybody screaming or shouting or without anybody being grounded for three months or whatever the punishment might've been. So we got through that. And again, the fact that I don't even remember what caused the problem or how we solved it, it was fairly matter of fact, it tells you that we had somebody who by this point had figured out she'd overspent and she knew what she needed to do. And now we're just talking about making sure how we work it out and exactly what we do about it. Yeah, Carol, I, your dad said a, a minute ago, a quote that gave me chills and honestly gave me insight into your family. <laughs> no, in a good, in the best possible way, like in a real insight into, into your family dynamic, right? He said, how do you want to solve this problem? Mm -hmm. Right. He didn't get angry. He knew that you were someone who, he could trust, right? You've had a seat at the table, a progressive, a progressive seat at the table over the last eight to 10 years. And all right, we have a problem. How do you want to solve it? And I think so many people just get frustrated. They start yelling and they think that's going to solve anything. Like that wasn't going to solve anything at all. Like, how do you want to solve this problem? And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts and, and reflection on that as like, the umbrella background, if you will, of the family, because it sounds like this is something that that permeates. It is. And it starts from a very young age. There's a joke in the family called door number three. And it's where oh, no. as a one of the one of the big parenting <laughs> tactics, and I'm sure you all have heard this before, is instead of overwhelming your toddler with all these decisions, you give them two choices. Do you want your blue shorts or do you want your black shorts? I use you know, that do you on want a regular basis. 
<laughs> yes. Well, there's Good a luck. funny thing. Have you gotten to the day where your son starts saying, no, I don't want the blue or the black shorts. I want the yellow shorts. It only happened twice Whoa. and both times it was devastating. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so that now, now expand that concept into the kids being older. You know, dad talked about all the discussions about what you can do with your money. And that was just them presenting doors. You know, you could spend all your money, door number one, or you could save all your money, door number two. And then it's up to the kid to figure out door number three. Well, I can spend some of my money and I can save some of my money as well. And so when it came to things like the bailout and when it came to bigger, more serious issues like going into debt, it was very easy for me to approach my parents because I knew that not only would they present doors number one and two, but we would also discuss a door number three. And so there's a lot of concepts for parenting that also work well when it comes to teaching your kids about money. It's very similar. You know, the last place that I want to I want to spend some time talking that I think is going to be very actionable and timely for our audience is the education fund. And I guess, Carol, your role as a good steward of the education fund. Doug, let, let's talk about college. I mean, you didn't know what Carol was going to do. You know, you, you know, you know what a, a, a lot of members of your family had done, but you didn't know right. what she was going to do, what she was going to choose. And you don't have that information when they're a child. So it sounds like you had an education fund, like kind of roll us through that thought process and how that played out. Well, when your kid is still in diapers, you know that you can start saving for college. You as a parent, you're supposed to be mature and responsible enough to do that. And I'm being a little snarky about that because we just knew that we needed to put some money aside for college. The earlier you start, the less money you have to put aside every week. So, you know, if you can put aside $100 a month when your kid is in diapers, that's a lot better than having to put aside $1,000 a month when they're in middle school. We did all the math and the spreadsheets and tried to figure out what we wanted to save up for college. And initially, our goal was just two years at a community college. We figured that would be a good start. Now, we invested that college fund pretty aggressively when she was a toddler and in elementary school. And as it grew and as we kept contributing to it and as we figured out our spending, our parent ideas began to evolve and we realized we could probably do four years at a state university and and then the money grew even bigger and we realized, hey, we've, we're not up to Harvard here, but we are getting up to a pretty good college at retail price. And so as that fund grew, our parental discussions between my wife and I, we realized that's what we wanted to spend our money on for our daughter to have her get launched to a good college education if that's what she wanted to do. We call it the education fund because we know that there are people out there that want to be plumbers and electricians and will make far more money than some kids who graduate from Harvard. So whether your kid wants to trade or college or whatever they want to do, you save that fund and then you talk about it with them. You manage their expectations and you try to figure out what they think they want to learn about when they finish high school. So that's where we went with all of that as the fund was growing. But again, aligning your kids financial motives now when you send them off to school and they've got this big fund that pays for everything they're tempted to just have the best of everything you, obviously you need a macbook <laughs> air to start with and the iphone that goes with it and exactly and they're making it rain so we aligned the financial incentives so we said if you're a good steward of the college fund then when you graduate from college there will be profit sharing and maybe you want to keep that college fund for your graduate degree after college. Maybe you want to have some money to get started on your career. But <clears throat> once you've demonstrated that you're taking care of the college fund, once you take care of the education fund, we'll do profit sharing. And so every time the question came up, you know, I need a better computer. I need to spend money on this. I want to go to do that. I want to go to Europe for spring break. I don't think we ever had that conversation, but no. every time a large sum of money came up, we'd say, well, is, is that what you want to do with the college fund? Because if, if you do that, there's going to be less money when you're done with the college fund and there's going to be less profit sharing. And at first there were discussions like that and she would go away and, and not really come back or she would figure it out on her own. And later on, she would say, here's what I want to do with the college fund. You know, we would not just have a question, we would have a problem statement and a proposed solution and the effects on profit sharing. And she was essentially managing the whole thing and we we're sending the money where it needed to go. That was very empowering, but it was because she knew that she was getting a financial incentive. She had that profit sharing to look forward to. Yeah. And it's Carol, from your perspective as a steward, as a manager of this education fund, I can only imagine that as you approach graduation from your undergraduate degree, uh, the profit sharing became very real. 
Uh, it did. <laughs> it did. And, and that was very interesting. You know, the, the thing about right now being in COVID-19, a lot of high school seniors, a lot of high schoolers in general are learning the importance of certain kinds of jobs. And they're learning that in certain economies, you can't control what happens. It just happens. And whether or not you have a job still standing at the end of that event becomes very crystal clear after a while. For me, I went through high school between 2006 and 2010. So I saw the, the best of the housing market, and then I saw the worst of the Great Recession. Uh, my senior year of high school, the uh, economy was so bad, the state of Hawaii could not afford to send <clears throat> kids to school five days a week. We used to call them furlough Fridays. We had to literally not go to school on certain Fridays because they couldn't afford to pay for the electricity to keep the campus on, and they couldn't pay the, the custodians to manage the campus, and so on and so forth. And so here I am sitting in high school, and I'm thinking about my college degree and what I want to major in, but I'm also thinking about the step after. You know, I'm learning as everybody else is learning during the Great Recession that holding a diploma doesn't necessarily mean you have a job. You have to earn the diploma and you have to earn the job. And so that's where the Navy actually became a big draw was I was learning a lot about the Naval Academy and how if you do four years in Naval Academy, then you have at least a five-year career in the Navy afterwards. That's a ready-made paycheck. That's ready training. There's all these military benefits that you can get. And it's also the same thing. Free school. Well, <laughs> there's a price, of course. You're you're paying that obligation off. You have to work for five years in the military. And if you don't finish those five years, well, then you owe that physical cash back to the military. And it works the same way in Navy ROTC and Air Force ROTC and all these different ROTC programs is you, again, have the military paying for college, but this time you're going to a civilian school. You're not going to a service academy. And when you finish that civilian school, once again, you owe a five-year obligation to the military and you have to have, hold that job for at least five years. But for a kid like me that's in the middle of the Great Recession who's wondering whether or not my degree is going to actually get me a job, that's a guaranteed job. And on top of that being a guaranteed job, that's guaranteed work experience. So at the end of the five years, whether or not I actually want to stay in the military, I can at least put on my resume, I've learned how to do middle management, I've learned how to handle large budgets and technology, and oh, by the way, I have work experience. And so I knew that that would be the best stepping stone next in the life. And the other incentive for doing ROTC, as dad mentioned, was profit sharing. Mom and dad made it clear from a very young age that there was going to be enough money for college. And I could have become a plumber. I could have become an electrician, but I did want to go to college. I did want to do engineering, and I wanted to have a more advanced degree. But when it came to paying for that degree, there was this draw of ROTC paying for everything, and then I pay back by working. And then... I get 50% of whatever is left in the college fund. So to sum that all up, I just got college for free. I have a job. I have the ability to invest in the 401k. I have health care. I have resume experience. And I have profit sharing from whatever is left in the college fund. And so now we're not just talking about monetary value. We're once again talking about life energy. And we're talking about different kinds of life tools that aren't just dollars and cents. There are things that can't be quantified as money. There are things that can only be quantified as value. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. And and we covered a lot here. And to be honest, we're just starting to scrape the book. I really want people to know this. Like we're recording this ahead of time. I promise you, as soon as the pre-order link goes live, I will be the first person beating Brad Barrett to order this book. I will. I'm, I'm just right now, I'm, that's going to happen. But when you take a look at the life experience that's included in the book and the elements that we talked about on this show, Carol, how did that set you up? Like on your own path to financial independence, your own money lessons, like what what does that mean for you now and in the future in terms of your path to financial independence? I have to admit COVID-19 has made me think, oh, thank God, over and over again about being financial independent. You know, it's, you, it's a neighborhood effect. You see folks that are becoming stressed all over again because they were already living paycheck to paycheck and suddenly that paycheck disappeared. And then on the flip side of things, you're seeing a whole new form of stress. Everybody has to homeschool their kids now. There's no more child care. <laughs> and, and no one could have predicted that coming. You know, it's, Can you imagine if you had both still kept your jobs, but now you had to find someone else to take care of your kids? And so being financially independent meant that I could be at home with our daughter. So when it came time to, hey, your kids have to be at home all day, it was, well, she's already at home all day. So what's what's the difference in lifestyle here? You know, when it when it came to this major catastrophic event for the economy and for people, it was very little change here at the Pittner household. Everything just kept running as they normally would. Yeah, and a lot of that is really due to this ultimately lifelong pursuit of five that that your parents yep. 
taught you and instilled in you, right? So, it, you know, it sounds like this decision to go into the reserves was not something that on day one as an ensign that you had planned. It sounded like, mm -hmm. you know, as you thought about having children, as you thought about your life, that that this evolved. And, and I'd love to just kind of hear how Phi played into that, because as, as I understand it, your husband is still active duty Navy. You know, talk me through like that decision as a family and also like how you talk to your husband about Phi, because he didn't grow up with with your parents. Right. But like he didn't. So, right. Talk us through this this entire journey, like as you know, your early marriage and now having kids and moving to part time. Like, I think this all kind of ties together with this Phi life. In my opinion, the root of FI is the ability to have choices. It's not just about being able to leave your job. It's because you want to work a better job, not this job. It's the ability to spend your day traveling all the time instead of sitting at a desk all day. You know, For me, FI is all about having choices and being able to make those choices. And so when it came to the Navy, I played a game every day in my naval career called, is it going to be a five-year day or a 20-year day? <laughs> and you know, 20 years is what you need for the pension. Five years is what you need to finish out your initial obligation. So was I going to make it to five years? Was I going to only do five years in the Navy because I was getting sick and tired of this job and I wanted to move on? Or was I going to do 20 years in the Navy because I was having way too much fun and I wanted to keep going? And so it was it was just writing on the wall. You know, it, it was a, a hash mark in the five-year day when I had a bad day. It was a hash mark on the 20-year day when I had a good day. And after a while, those hash marks started to add up. Well, on top of that, I when I went to the Navy, I was single, and barely a few months into the Navy, that's when I met my husband, and we got married about halfway through our current careers, about three years in. Well, for him, he had grown up for a brief period of time. His family was poor. You know, he was born earlier than his parents had expected. His father was still earning his PhD in medical research, which is again, that's a fantastic field. That's a very high earning salary but his dad was still in the process of earning the PhD. So the family was not living on very much at the time. And so my husband was basically at the poverty line when he was a kid. He was learning how important money is when it comes to just stress management and health of the family. And in some cases, you know, making sure that your next meal isn't just going to be oatmeal again. And so by the time he was graduated from college and we were both in the Navy, he knew to save his money. And like most Naval Academy graduates, he had something called the Career Starter Loan, which was a $25,000 loan at just 1%. And that was less than going out and getting an auto loan at 5 to 8%. So he naturally spent a portion of $25,000 on a brand new car. And he had been saving a little bit of his paycheck, but he'd been doing what everyone else in the United States had been taught, you know, about 5 to 10%. And that's really about it. And so between meeting me and me saving between 40 and 90% of my paycheck at the time and meeting my parents, which he actually met my parents after we got engaged, but meeting my parents and, and learning about financial independence and everything that dad has at the military guide, he really loved this idea of never having to experience that idea of being poor ever again. He really enjoyed the fact that not only is he having enough money that he can make his own choices, but it's also an element of I never have to worry about my family worrying about their next meal in the way that I did as a kid. All right, everyone, I think this is probably the most actionable, important episode that we have recorded possibly ever, especially for those of you that personally have been on this path for a long time and had this stuff locked down. This was new information, right? You're grappling, as am I, with how do I instill this and see my kids grab onto this of their own volition. This book, I begged Doug. I begged Doug, let <laughs> us let us help you publish this book. I want to, everybody needs to get access to this. Everybody needs this information. Let us be a part of this in some capacity and help promote this. If you're hearing this right now, I've set up a landing page for you where you can pre-order the book and get access to a live webinar. I asked Doug and Carol if they would do a live webinar for our audience and specifically for people who pre-order the book. If you want to pre-order the book, you want to access the live webinar, go to write this down right now, choosefi.com slash next gen, N-E-X-T-G-E-N, choosefi.com slash next gen. Now here's what you're going to see on that landing page. Obviously a way to order the book. If this is before the book goes live, it'll be the pre-order. If you're listening to this months later, then you'll be able to order the book uh, as you would expect. Also, you'll be able to register for this webinar. If you're doing this ahead of the webinar, this will be a live webinar for you. You will be able to ask Doug and Carol your questions. Well, how do I do this with my kids? How do I troubleshoot this situation? How do I implement the Kid 401k? What does that actually look like? On that webinar, we're going to give you a digital copy 
of the kid 401k that Doug talked about in this show. And Doug and Carol will show you how to use it. Incredibly high value. If you're listening to this months later, you'll be able to watch the replay and have the same experience. So don't let that hold you back, but you need this book. It's an important book. It hasn't existed up to this point. Go to choose fi.com slash next gen. Brad, was I, was I clear? Did I communicate that effectively? <laughs> that was crystal clear. I'm very impressed, Jonathan. And you even spelled next gen. I love it. Close the loop, man. That's <laughs> what my good buddy has always taught me. You got to close the loop. All right, Doug and Carol, first of all, thank you so much for taking, being so generous with your time, taking the time to, first of all, put this book together and also to join us on the show today, share it with our audience. Uh, if people are hearing this and they want to connect with you, they want to find out more about the work that you've been doing outside of this book, and more about your story, generally just have a follow-up question. What is the best way? Start with you, Doug. What is the best way to connect with you? All right, you can ask the military questions at the Military Guide. Uh, we've been doing this for a decade, so we're at the top of the search engines. Uh, you can also send me an email, nords, nords at gmail.com. And I'm on Facebook. My entire Facebook profile is public to uh, show you the glamorous financial independence lifestyle. But the idea is that you can reach out and connect with me on Facebook as well. And Carol, what about you? So we are building a website right now called childfire.com. You can go ahead and access the site now, but it is under some heavy construction. So it may look various stages of finished right now. I'm also on all the Facebook groups. So I'm in a lot of the Choose 5 Facebook groups. I go by my name and you can always message me there as well. Doug and Carol, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. We really enjoy it. All right, everyone, I hope you got value from today's episode. Honestly, uh, if you are pursuing financial independence with a family, this is probably the most valuable episode that we have done up to this point. And it's hard for me to overstate how important this book will be for your family's financial future, for your kids' financial future. We don't want our kids' financial independence to be dependent on our success. We want to give them the money lessons they need ahead of time so they can build their own financial independence. That's what winning looks like. And that's what Doug and Carol's story illustrates. And this book is all about to pre-order your copy of this book. And for more information on the webinar that we mentioned in the episode, just go to choosefi.com slash next gen, N-E-X-T-G-E-N, next gen. And if you got value from today's episode, share it with a friend, a family member, someone that could benefit from this content, press subscribe on your podcast player of choice. We're on all the platforms whether or not you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Dogcast, Overcast FM, we're there. Press subscribe, lock it in. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.